Smithsonian Associates Sponsored Lecture, Part 1, presented by Bard D. Ehrman. Christianity's Triumph, How Faith Conquered an Empire. Christianity's Most Important Convert, the Apostle Paul. I'm Mary McLaughlin. I'm a program coordinator with the Smithsonian Associates, and I'd like to welcome you today to our seminar that looks at how Christianity became the official religion of the Roman Empire. It is a great pleasure to welcome our speaker, Dr. Bart Ehrman, back to the Smithsonian. I know that many of you here in the audience today are already acquainted with Bart. He has presented many, many outstanding programs for us over the course of the past 14 years relating to the New Testament and the history of early Christianity, and he has developed a very strong and loyal following among Smithsonian Associate members. Professor Ehrman is the James A. Gray Distinguished Professor of Religious Studies at the University of, Car of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, where he has taught since 1988. He has published extensively in the fields of New Testament and early Christianity, having written or edited 31 books, including five New York Times bestsellers. His books have been translated into 27 languages. Professor Ehrman's work has been featured in Time, Newsweek, The New Yorker, The Washington Post, and other print media, and his television appearances have included NBC's Dateline, CNN, The History Channel, National Geographic, The Discovery Channel, PBS, and NPR. <coughs> Excuse me. He has won numerous university awards and grants, including the 2009 J.W. Pope Spirit of Inquiry Teaching Award, the 1993 University of North Carolina Undergraduate Student Teaching Award, the 1994 Philip and Ruth Hedelman Prize for Artistic and Scholarly Achievement, and the Bowman and Gordon Gray Award for Excellence in Teaching. Well, thank you. We need to uh, tend to the lights. Thank you. Let there be no light. <laughs> right. Ah, uh, uh, well, it's a pleasure to be with you. Uh, is the sound working? Is this is kind of echoey here, but you can hear it okay? Yeah, it's good? Yeah, good, good. Okay, great. So, uh, right, this, uh, this seminar is uh, on the triumph of Christianity in the ancient uh, world, and this is based on the book uh, uh, by a similar title, The Triumph of Christianity. Um, the book actually is uh, being published on Tuesday, uh, but the publisher uh, graciously allowed for books to be available uh, today for anybody who wants to buy them. Uh, and they, it wasn't sort of being good-hearted about it. They want to sell books. <laughs> I mean, so it's not like they're being generous or something. Uh, so um, let me say something about the title uh, before I get into my, uh, my talk. Um, I've had a lot of colleagues of mine who also teach uh, early Christianity who have questioned the title, uh, The Triumph of Christianity. Isn't that like being a little bit triumphalistic about it? Uh, like, you know, this is the greatest thing that ever happened, and you really want to say that, and, and all that. So um, the deal is that um, most, most trade books, books written for a general audience, uh, the uh, publisher decides what the title is rather than the author. Uh, this became crystal clear uh, to me with one of my early books, um, my book, uh, Misquoting Jesus. Uh, so uh, so the, the book, Misquoting Jesus, I never liked the title for that book. The, book. the book was about how Christian scribes in the early centuries changed the, uh, the text of the New Testament when they were copying it, where they, they changed what it said so that uh, either accidentally, usually by accident, but sometimes on purpose, they would alter its words uh, so that in the history of the text being transmitted, the text got changed. And uh, so what I wanted to call the book, uh, I, there was a title somebody suggested to me that I really liked, which I wanted to call it uh, Lost in Transmission. And uh, I thought, that's great. That, that captures it, lost in transmission. My publisher uh, decided they didn't want to call it that. Uh, and the reason was they thought that if somebody goes into the Barnes & Noble and uh, looks on the shelf and they see lost in transmission, that they would think it was about NASCAR. <laughs> I told them that, you know, in my part of the world, that would improve sales. 
So, but they, uh, as it turns out, though, uh, this particular title, The Triumph of Christianity, is the one that I, uh, I suggested to them. Um, it will be clear throughout the course of these lectures that it's not because I am uh, approaching this historical phenomenon from a triumphalistic point of view. I, I don't celebrate it as a fantastic thing, but I also don't denigrate it as a bad thing. I'm neutral as a historian. There are certainly good things that happened when Christianity took over, like the history of the West. <laughs> I mean, our culture is dependent, uh, as I'll be arguing, is the, what we think of as high culture, uh, literature, art, music, and philosophy. And I mean, all of that would have been massively different if, uh, if Christianity had not taken over the religions of Rome. Uh, so, uh, so it, it, it uh, it's a great thing in many ways for many of us, but there are a lot of things lost as well. When one side wins, another side loses. And so there are losses. And we'll be talking about both win wins and losses. So anyway, that's, that's just about the title. Uh, let me give some introductory comments, which I see I've already started giving. Uh, so, the historical and cultural impact of Christianity. I don't think there's been any force in Western civilization that has been more influential than Christianity for the last 1,700 years. There's no institution that's been more powerful than the Christian church. I mean, it's not so much the case today in our, in our increasingly secular world, but you just think about the history of Western civilization for the last 1,700 years. What, what institution has been more powerful than the church? Um, <laughs> And it's, it's not, I mean, you, you, can, you can gauge this, this in, not just in terms of religion, but um, in terms of politics, uh, culturally, socially, just about every way. If you actually look at what happened from the, uh, from the early Middle Ages, through the Middle Ages, to the Renaissance, to the Reformation, to modernity as we know it, it's the Christian church. Uh, and in terms of culture, I mean, you, you simply can't understand Western culture without understanding the impact of Christianity. Uh, literature, think about the literature over the last 1,700 years. Much of it has been, most of it, I mean, the vast majority of it has been Christian until recently, recent times. Uh, but even recent literature is dependent on its own heritage, and its heritage is a Christian heritage. Or music. I mean, you wouldn't have had Baroque music if you hadn't had its predecessors. Its predecessors go back into the Middle Ages, and that's all music de developed in Christian circles. And so the, it's massively important that Christianity became the religion of the West. And so uh, that's what the topic is. Uh, what's striking is that Christianity didn't start out as a powerful religion at all. In the New Testament, which I think has got to be right about this particular point, uh, after Jesus' death, there were, uh, there were a group of people who came to believe in him, his 11 men disciples and a handful of women, Mary Magdalene and a few others. So, so say 20 people after Jesus' death came to think he got raised from the dead and in some sense began to believe in him. Okay? The, these 20 people are lower class, illiterate, day laborers in a remote part of the Roman Empire. They are nobodies. Three centuries later, there are something like three million believers, Christian believers in the world. Three million. The Roman Emperor Constantine converts in the year 312. I'll have an entire lecture on Constantine. It'll be our, our last lecture. The Roman emperor himself converts in 312. By the end of the fourth century, uh, half of the Roman Empire is Christian, and by the end of the fourth century, Christianity is declared the official religion of Rome. And my question is, uh, so yeah, by the end of the fourth century, 30 million believers, that's half of the empire. And so my question is, how did it happen? How do you get from 20 people, especially 20 people like that, to 30 million people. How'd that happen? And, and it ended up affecting the entire history of the West in ways that are virtually incalculable. And so that's what the topic is. I've been interested in this topic for a very long time. 
Um, and I, uh, I wanted to write this book for a very long time, and I kept putting it off. The reason I kept putting it off is because it seemed to me it was such a big topic. There are like so many things involved with it, and it's, they're, it's complicated. And so I kept putting it off until finally I decided, okay, it's time to do it. And so I did it, and so that's what these lectures will be about. We're going to start in these lectures with uh, the person that I think is the most important convert to Christianity in the, history, uh, in the history of the religion. Many people would say that Constantine's conversion is the most important, but Constantine would not have converted if Paul had not converted. I think the Apostle Paul is the most important convert for reasons that I will uh, explain in this lecture. This lecture will be entirely about the Apostle Paul. So, what can we say about Paul? As is true of every historical figure, if you want to talk about somebody, you need some sources of information. And so what, what sources of information do we have for knowing about this person, Paul, uh, otherwise sometimes known as uh, Saul of Tarsus? Uh, by the way, sometimes people th think that uh, when Paul converted that his name was Saul, and he got converted, and then his name became Paul. Uh, see, uh, a number of you saying, yes, you've heard that. That's wrong. Uh, that's not actually the case. Saul is his Hebrew name. Paul is his Greek name. He himself never calls himself Saul. He's called Saul in the book of Acts in the New Testament uh, before he converts, but he's also called Saul after he converts. And so it just depends whether you're talking Arama speaking Aramaic or speaking Greek, what you call this guy. Uh, what are our sources of information? There are 27 books in the New Testament. 27 books in the New Testament altogether, 13 of them claim to be written by Paul. 13 of the 27 books claim to be written by Paul. Scholars today doubt whether six of those were actually written by Paul. Scholars have reasons for doubting that six of those go back to Paul. They, these other six look like they're other authors claiming to be Paul when they're not Paul. Uh, so whether you think that or not, you've either got 13 letters or you've got nine letters. You got, I mean, basically, everybody pretty much agrees that there are seven letters that Paul wrote. So, well, that's a good source of information for somebody if you've got their, if you've got their letters. If you want to know about Paul's biography, these letters are useful, but they are uh, of, of limited usefulness because Paul rarely uh, gives autobiographical information in his letters. Uh, just as when you write your emails, you usually don't say much about your autobiography. I mean, every now and then you might say something off the cuff, but you, you just don't talk about your autobiography when you write your emails. He didn't say much about his autobiography. On occasion, he will. And that's useful for then trying to reconstruct his life. There's another source for knowing about Paul, which is the New Testament book of Acts. The New Testament book of Acts, the fifth book of the New Testament after the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, then the book of Acts. The Gospels are all about the life, the death, the resurrection of Jesus. The book of Acts is about what happens to his followers after his death and how they spread Christianity throughout the Roman world in the first 30 years. Uh, so it's about the spread of Christianity by the apostles of Jesus. And the main figure in the book of Acts is the Apostle Paul. Uh, he's the dominant figure for the final two-thirds of the book of Acts. Well, that's helpful. You've got a history that has Paul as its subject. That's good. The problem with Acts, using it uh, as a biographical source for Paul, uh, is that we're not sure about its accuracy. The reason we're not sure about its accuracy, there are a couple things. One thing is, it appears to have been written about 20 years after Paul's death. And even though it's traditionally said to have been written by a companion of Paul named Luke, there are real serious reasons for doubting that. Uh, so uh, the reason to doubt that is because in a number of places, the book of Acts will talk about something that Paul also talks about in his letters. And when you compare what Acts says about Paul with what Paul says about himself in, in these various places, there are almost always discrepancies that make it really hard to think that this person actually knew Paul because we have Paul's words about this particular subject, and Acts says this about it, and they seem to be different from each other. So people use the book of Acts to try and reconstruct what Paul's life was all about, but uh, they have to use it uh, fairly gingerly. Uh, they, you can't just kind of trust everything it says automatically. There, is, there are other sources for Paul, especially legendary accounts. 
Starting in the second century, we start getting legendary accounts of Paul, including the most important legendary account is a book called The Acts of Paul, which is a, it's an account of Paul's missionary uh, escapades. Uh, and they're very interesting, and they are clearly legendary. Uh, one of my favorite is, uh, yeah, Paul and the Baptized Lion. And so there's this story uh, where in, in the Acts of Paul, where Paul has been, uh, he's been arrested for engaging in Christian activities, and they decide to throw him to the wild beasts in the arena. And so they take him and they throw him in the arena, and they, throw, they let the beasts out, and this big lion comes up to Paul. And everybody is watching this with great interest, because uh, nothing that, more than a little blood and gore. And so, uh, so this is going to be great. The lion comes up to Paul, looks at Paul, Paul looks at the lion, and Paul says, aren't you that lion I baptized? And the lion replies, yes, Paul, I am. <laughs> what are you doing here? Well, they captured me just like they captured you. Aye, 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 how are we going to get out of here? And then God sends a thunderstorm. It hails. It kills all the other beasts. Uh, Paul and the lion escape. The lion goes back to the mountains. Paul goes on to his missionary journeys, and life goes on. So, uh, right, so we, we, get, we get stories like that in the Acts of Paul, which are great, they're entertaining, but it's not as if these are historically reliable accounts of what happened in the life of the Apostle. And so we don't, uh, it's nice to have them, and they're, uh, they are worth, they're absolutely worth studying, but not so much for knowing about the life of Paul. So the, the short story is our best source is Paul's letters, but they don't give us a lot of information. They give us enough to, for what I want to talk about today. The book of Acts can supplement that, and the later legends, not so much. Let me give you a basic timeline uh, so we're on the same page chronologically. Uh, almost everybody agrees that Jesus died around the year 30 of the Common Era. It might have been the year 29, it might have been the year 33, but there are reasons for putting it right in there somewhere around the year 30 of the Common Era, so AD 30. Paul persecuted the Christians, as we'll see in a minute, uh, before he himself became a Christian. And you can map out Paul's chronology to show that probably he was persecuting Christians for a year or two, maybe around the year 32 or 33. The way we get to the years for Paul is that in a few very precious places, Paul will say, three years after that, I did this. And then he'll say, you know, 15 years later, I did that. And so you can actually add up the numbers, and if you have some points of reference, you can put it all together, and they're scholars. They're actually scholars who spend their whole lives trying to figure out Paul's chronology, uh, which isn't the sort of thing I want to do on a Friday night, but there are people who do that. And uh, so this is pretty widely accepted. He was persecuting Christians 32 to 33. He uh, converted around the year 33, so about three years after Jesus' death is when Paul converted after persecuting the Christians. He goes on his missionary work trying to convert people, principally pagans, uh, Gentiles, to the faith, and it's about a 30-year ministry. Uh, the first letter that he wrote that we have is 1 Thessalonians. 1 Thessalonians is usually dated to 49 of the Common Era, um, 49, 50, right in there somewhere, so it's about 20 years after Jesus' death. This is Paul's first letter. It's the first writing of any kind we have from a Christian. This is the earliest Christian writing. Uh, the letter of 1 Thessalonians. Uh, Paul's final letter is his letter to the Romans, written around the year 62, and it's usually thought that he died uh, in the year 64. That, that's probably right, but it's not, it's not absolutely certain, but it's almost certain it's sometime around then. Okay, so that's, that's just a basic timeline so we, we see what we're talking about. Let me talk a little bit about Paul's life. Uh, and focusing on his original, <coughs> his original persecution of Christians. One of the most important things to understand about Paul is that he was a highly religious Jew. He started out as a highly religious Jew. In one of his very few autobiographical uh, statements, he points out in his letter to the Galatians that he was, uh, he was born Jewish, he had Jewish parents, he was circumcised, and he was highly religious. He was zealous for the traditions of the Jewish fathers, uh, more advanced in religion than others of his age, his age group, he, he tells us. He was a highly religious Jew. What would that mean in the ancient world? Well, it, it will help to get some basic sense of what it meant to be a religious Jew in the first century. 
And so I'll give you a very a quick run through of some of the important points. First, it would mean that he was a monotheist. As we'll see in the next lecture, the vast majority of people living in the uh, Roman Empire were, were polytheists. They believed in many gods. Jews were the only people who believed that there's only one God, or at least they believed there's only one God who is to be worshipped. Jews worshipped one God, not many gods. Uh, at this time, there are various estimates, but most people think that uh, the Jewish population of the Roman Empire was maybe 5 to 7%. 5 to 7% of the empire was Jewish. The empire is usually said to be about 60 million people, so we're talking about 4 million Jews in the world. And uh, so they're not, it's not a massive, it's a small minority. Uh, and one thing that makes them stand out is they think there's only one God. This God is the God who created the world. The God who created the entire universe at one point chose his people, Israel was chosen by God to be his people. And so they worship God, and he is, uh, he is their God. This one God has, in fact, made a covenant with the Jewish people, a kind of uh, agreement, a kind of like a peace treaty with them, that in exchange for their devotion, he will protect and defend them. That is at the very heart of ancient Judaism. We are the people of the covenant. We are the people that God has chosen, and if we follow what he tells us to do, he will continue to be our God. He has saved us, and now uh, we, we, uh, we follow his will. So there's a covenant, and that covenant involves the law. The law, sometimes called the law of Moses, because it was uh, widely thought that it's found in the Bible, that the law of God was given to this great uh, prophetic Savior figure from many centuries earlier, Moses, who had uh, been used by God to bring about the exodus of the children of Israel from their slavery in Egypt and then gave them his law. The law consists of the Ten Commandments, of course, but it consists of all of the commandments that you can find in the Old Testament. There are, by number, 613 of these commandments. Now, my students uh, in Chapel Hill, which, as you uh, probably know, is in the Bible Belt, uh, my students typically think uh, that Judaism is a really harsh religion filled with laws that no one can obey. And the idea is that God gave Jews a bunch of hard laws so that, so that they wouldn't keep them, and since they wouldn't keep them, they'd go to hell. And... Uh, and then what he did is he sent Jesus because everybody needed him because everybody was going to hell. And then they realized, oh, it's much better to believe in Jesus than go to hell. And so, uh, and so Christianity is the solution to the problem caused by Judaism. And in this view, uh, the Jewish law is this burden, this onerous, who can possibly keep this law? Uh, so far as we know, there weren't any Jews who thought that in the ancient world. Uh, the law was not a huge burden, and frankly, it wasn't all that difficult. I mean, you know, thou shalt not murder. Oh, no, I can't stop myself. Oh, it's just so tempting. Uh, so, I mean, uh, so I mean, there, are, there, are, there are laws that might seem kind of, they seem strange to modern people, but look, we have strange laws too. I mean, we have all sorts of laws about what you can ingest, for example. You know, what kinds of things you can put in your mouth. Uh, and, and or how old you have to be to put them in your mouth, or whether you can ever put them in your mouth. And, and it's like, uh, we have all these, I mean, 613 laws, we have more than 613 traffic laws. <laughs> and so we, our law code is amazing. I mean, so, so 613 laws is not, is not that big of a deal. So Paul, like other Jews, thought the law had been given by God as a great gift. It was not seen as a burden. And it was, this is the key point, the law was not the way to earn salvation. It's not that you earn salvation by keeping the law. You were already saved by God. You were a member of the covenant. The law is how you respond out of gratitude to God. The laws involve how to worship God. There are laws about how to worship God, and there are laws about how to behave in your community. So this is great. God has told us. How to, how to live this life. And so it was seen as a great joy to follow and uh, a great thing to have.
Paul was a certain kind of Jew that we know about from other kinds of writings from the time uh, that uh, scholars would call an apocalyptic Jew. Most Jews, most, it appears that most Jews at the time, at, at least, yeah, it appears that most Jews at this time had a kind of apocalyptic bent. The, the word apocalyptic comes from the Greek word apocalypse, which means a revelation or a revealing and unveiling. Jewish apocalypticists believed that God had revealed to them the secrets that could make sense of what's happening here. These were the heavenly secrets that made sense of earthly realities. In particular, apocalypticists believed they could explain why the world is in such a mess. Many of us are wondering that. <laughs> why is the world in such a mess? Uh, Jewish apocalypticists thought they solved the problem. It's because there are forces of evil in the world that are creating havoc. Uh, you have droughts and famines and earthquakes and tsunamis and floods and epidemics and wars and rumors of war and you have just awful suffering in this world. Why? Because there are forces of evil that are in control of this world temporarily. Soon, God is going to intervene and destroy these forces of evil and bring in a utopian state. And so these Jewish apocalypticists believed that they were living at the end of the age and that, that things had gotten just as bad as they could possibly get and God was soon going to intervene and make things right again. When God did that, he would raise people from the dead. God is going to make it right, not only for people who happen to be living at the time, but people who died already. So that you shouldn't think that you could um, side with the forces of evil and therefore become uh, rich and powerful and influential and then die and get away with it. You can't die and get away with it because God's going to raise you from the dead to face judgment. And there's not a sweet thing you can do to stop him. If, on the other hand, you have suffered unjustly, God's going to raise you from the dead and bring you into a, his utopian state, the kingdom of God. There's going to be a resurrection of the dead at the end of the age. Paul thought this before he became a Christian. There were Jews in Paul's day who were expecting that this great deliverance of God would come through the future Messiah. The term Messiah uh, is frequently misunderstood uh, today. The word Messiah actually comes from the Hebrew word Mashiach. Mashiach is a word that means uh, anointed, anointed one, anointed one. The, uh, the Greek equivalent of Mashiach, the anointed one, is Christos. So we get the word Messiah from the Hebrew Mashiach. We get the Greek word uh, we get the, the word Christ from the Greek equivalent, Christos. It's the same word, Messiah, Christ, same word. Um, the Messiah, why do they call the Messiah the anointed one? This is a reference originally probably to uh, the king of Israel. The king of Israel was understood to be God's representative on earth. When a person became a king, when the man became king, there was a, there was a thing that happened in the coronation ceremony where uh, he would have perfumed oil poured on his head as a symbol of divine favor. So he was the, literally the anointed one. He, had, he was anointed with oil. In the Old Testament, God promises the great ancient king of Israel, David, that he, David, would always have a descendant sitting on the throne in Jerusalem. David would always have a descendant on the throne. David was a great warrior who destroyed the enemies and set up God's kingdom, and it was great, uh, the, the ancient golden days of Israel. And he would always have a descendant on the throne. And that, that actually was true for about 400 years until the Babylonians came in and wiped out uh, the nation of, uh, of Judah and destroyed Jerusalem and took the Jewish king off the throne, and there's no Jewish king. Some Jewish thinkers thought, that, look, God had promised we'd always have a Mashiach, we'd always have a king on the throne. There's not a king now on the throne. God's going to bring a king under the throne in the future. He'll be like David. He'll be a descendant of David. He'll be a son of David. He will be 
a warrior who drives out the enemy and sets up the kingdom, just like David. And so the, the Messiah is going to be a figure of grandeur and power, a mighty figure who will destroy the enemy and rule God's people in, in Jerusalem. That's what Paul uh, and other Jews of his day were expecting when they, uh, uh, when they were thinking about the future Messiah. Uh, a lot of Christians today think that the Messiah was somebody who was supposed to die for the sins of the world and be raised from the dead. Uh, that's not an expectation that any Jew had. It's not an expectation that any Jew had at the time. The Messiah was supposed to be something else. He wasn't supposed to die and be raised from the dead. Which brings uh, me to the Christian claims about Jesus in Paul's day that led to his persecution. Christians claimed that Jesus was the Messiah. So I'm talking about the year 31, the year 32, just a couple years after Jesus' death. The, the Christians are saying, Jesus is the Messiah. And most Jews thought, that's crazy. What? The Messiah is supposed to be this figure who destroys the enemy and sets up the kingdom. Who was Jesus? He was a crucified criminal. He didn't destroy the enemy. He got publicly tortured to death by the enemy. He was humiliated and tortured to death. That's the Messiah? That can't be the Messiah. Are you kidding me? It's like it's the opposite of the Messiah. And so uh, this idea of Jesus being the Messiah was just ludicrous. I mean, people, just, they laughed at the idea. Most Jews laughed at the idea. Paul didn't laugh so much. Paul actually got angry about it. This led to Paul's persecutions of the Christians. Paul thought that it was blasphemous to say that Jesus was the Messiah because he was just the opposite of the Messiah. He clearly wasn't. And not only that, but there was something fairly specific about Jesus in particular that showed he could not be the Messiah, which was this. It was his mode of execution that he was crucified. He was nailed to a wooden stake, a tree. The reason that was a problem was because the Old Testament itself, in the Law of Moses, it says explicitly, cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. Cursed is everyone, or cursed is anyone who hangs on a tree. Jesus was hanged on a tree. That meant he was under God's curse. And so the Christians are saying that the person that God cursed is the one who is favored of God. They are so wrong about that. And it's dangerous, and Paul apparently tried to stamp it out. Paul himself says that he uh, persecuted the church violently and tried to destroy it. We don't know what exactly Paul was doing. In the book of Acts, what, in the book of Acts this is something I don't think you can trust about the book of Acts. What, what Acts says is that the high priest in Jerusalem gave Paul the authorization to go out and arrest Christians and take them back, into, take them back to jail. The reason I don't think that that's plausible is, uh, well, there aren't Jewish jails. Right? We don't have any record of anything like a Jewish jail. A jail for Jews? I mean, what is that? And, and the Romans don't care if somebody's blaspheming the God of, I mean, Romans don't care about that. So they're not going to Romans jail, Roman jail. So what is that? I don't know what it is, but it really doesn't make any sense. Well, if, if that's not it, what is it? I don't know. I mean, it may be that Paul's just beating people up. Uh, he, he may just be taking them out and beating them up. Or maybe he's using the synagogue as to have some kind of internal uh, punishment within the, with the synagogue authorities. We, we don't really know. What we do know is that he had a major turnaround. And Paul, who had been persecuting the Christians, became one himself. The one who was opposed to Christ became an apostle of Christ. Our sources of information about Paul's conversion. The most important source is Paul does say something about it in a couple of places in his letters. The accounts that most people know today are based not on his letters, but on the book of Acts. So when people today think about Paul's conversion, uh, blinded by the light, falling to the ground, hearing Jesus call out, Paul, Paul, or Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Uh, that whole scene on the road to Damascus, that's from the book of Acts. 
It's recounted in Acts chapter 9. It's recounted two more times in Acts chapter 22 and Acts chapter 26. And what's interesting is the three accounts don't agree with each other. Uh, in, in, sometimes in just little details. So in, uh, in one of the accounts, we're told that the companions who are with Paul, uh, uh, they, uh, they heard the voice, but they didn't see anything. When Christ appeared in this blinding light uh, and says, you know, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? They heard the voice and they didn't see anything. The other account says they saw the light, but they didn't hear anything. It's just the opposite. Or one account says that Paul is supposed to, uh, um, that, oh, one account says that the people with him are, uh, are left standing. And the other account says they all fell to the ground. So it's just the opposite. One account, uh, Paul is told, go, to, uh, go into Damascus and Ananias, this person there, will tell you what to do next. The other account, Paul's not to, told to do that. Jesus tells him what to do next. So these are at odds with you. It doesn't look like he's trying to get his story straight. So it's a, it's a little bit problematic. But we do have Paul himself talking about it. And what Paul says does agree with Acts, an important point, namely that there, it involves some kind of visionary experience. Now, when I say Paul had a vision, I'm not, I'm not um, saying that he saw something that wasn't really there. I'm just saying he actually saw, he saw something. If you're, if you're a Christian, you would say, most Christians would say, well, he saw Jesus because Jesus appeared to him. If you're not a Christian, you'd say he was having a hallucination. But either way, I mean, he, he's seeing something. And so all, I, all I'm pointing out is that this was a visionary experience involving, involving vision. Uh, what was the vision? Oops, what was the vision? Uh, Paul, Paul himself is explicit. Uh, Paul claims that he saw Christ alive. He saw Christ alive, and this is about three years after Jesus' death. And so he had some kind of vision of Jesus. Paul mentions it in a couple of places. Um, and what he says in uh, Galatians is that uh, this is the point at which God revealed his son to me. S-O-N. This is when God revealed his son to me. In other places, he talks about seeing Jesus after his death. What matters for our purposes here isn't so much whether that really happened or not, whether he really saw something or he just had a hallucination. What matters are the implications that Paul himself drew from seeing Jesus several years after his death. Several implications. What, what ends up happening is Paul has to start making sense of what it is he's just seen. He believes he's seen Jesus alive. What, what can that mean? And Paul starts fi- trying to figure out what it means. There are several implications. First, eschatological implications. The term eschatology means the, your uh, understanding of the end times, what's going to happen at the end. All of us have an eschatology. All of us have an idea of what's going to happen at the end. Uh, Some of us think Jesus is going to come back sometime next month. Uh, Some of us think uh, we're going to blow ourselves off the planet next month. Uh, Some of us think uh, that we're going to die and our soul's going to go to heaven or hell. Some of us think we're going to die, we're going to cease to exist. We all, all of us have some kind of idea of eschatology. Paul had an eschatology. Paul thought that, the, uh, that God was soon going to intervene in history and destroy the forces of evil and raise people from the dead. If he thought that at the very end of history as we know it, there was going to be a resurrection of the dead, what would he think if, if he came to believe that somebody had been raised from the dead? He would think that it started. The resurrection has begun. That's why he calls Jesus the first fruits of the resurrection, 1 Corinthians 15. He talks about Jesus as the first fruits of the resurrection. This is an agricultural image. The farmer, uh, when it comes time for harvest, goes out, first day of harvest, brings in some of the crops. Uh, That night they have a big celebration celebrating the incoming of the first fruits. And when does the farmer go out to get the rest of the crop? Does he wait 2,000 years? No, he goes the next day. Jesus has been raised as the first fruits, which means it started and everybody else is going to follow suit. That's why Paul, this confirmed to Paul, he's living at the end of time. Uh, So the end has started. 
Christological. This is, this is big. Why Jesus? Well, the only way Jesus could be alive now is if he came back from life and the only way back from the dead. And the only way he could come back from the dead is if God raised him from the dead. If God raised him from the dead, then God really does favor Jesus. But he cursed Jesus. So how does it work? Well, Paul has to figure that out. But the first thought is, I was wrong. He really is the one who's favored by God. He's not a false Messiah. He really is the Messiah. And so his understanding of Christ, his Christology, his understanding of Christ develops that he comes to think that Christ really is the one favorite of God. But how do you make sense of it? He was crucified on a tree. Well, this leads to his soteriological conclusion. Soteriology is your understanding of salvation. Your understanding of salvation. How does one get into a right relationship with God? Salvation. How does one get into a right relationship with God? Paul's soteriology developed as he tried to make sense of how Jesus could be crucified if he was the Messiah, because that's just the opposite of what you would expect of the Messiah. Paul had to make sense of how God could have cursed Christ if he was God's favored one. Paul reasoned, apparently he reasoned, that if, God, if Christ was God's favored one, as shown by the resurrection then he must not have been cursed for anything wrong that he had done. And Paul came to the conclusion that Christ was cursed for the wrongs other people had done. Paul came to think that Jesus was a kind of sacrifice. Uh, Paul was a citizen of the ancient world. He knew how sacrifices worked in pagan religions and in his own Judaism. Sacrifices, there are a number of reasons for sacrifices in the ancient world, but one of the reasons for a sacrifice in the ancient world is as, as a kind of substitute. The animal gives its life so that you don't have to give your life. It, it brings about a kind of atonement where God is satisfied with the sacrifice of some other being other than yourself. And since Christ would not have been killed for anything wrong he had done, because he's God's favored one, he must have died for others. And so the reason he got nailed to a cross is because he had to be a curse, because he had to become a curse for, the, for other people. Which means that salvation comes through the death of Christ. The death of Christ is not a miscarriage of justice. It's not just like uh, you know, something wrong that happened to, to Christ on one weekend, or, or it's, it's not just an accident. It, it was God's plan, because God obviously did it, because God raised him from the dead, so God must have meant, meant for him to die. And so it's the death and resurrection of Jesus that makes all the difference. This is how God has brought about salvation, but that has large implications. If God brought about salvation through the death of Jesus... Then, wait, I don't want that one yet. If you brought about the, uh, salvation through the death of Jesus, that means that a person is in a right standing before God, not just by being a member of the covenant, but by believing in this death that is a sacrifice for sins. But if it's the death of Jesus as the sacrifice for sins that puts somebody uh, and keeps somebody in a relationship with God, the law's got nothing to do with it. If a, if a person could stand in a right relationship with God by the law, all they'd have to do is become Jewish and keep the law. But if you could become right with God by being Jewish and keeping the law, there'd be no reason for God to have Christ sacrificed. Since he was sacrificed, the law's got nothing to do with it. And that has huge implications because it means that people who are right with God don't have to be Jewish. And that means that the salvation of Christ can go to Gentiles who can become followers of Christ without being Jewish. Before Paul came to this realization, the Christians maintained that, yes, Jesus' salvation brings, Jesus' death brings salvation, and since Jesus is the Jewish Messiah sent from the Jewish God to the Jewish people in fulfillment of the Jewish law, then you have got to be Jewish. So, yes, you can believe in Jesus, Become Jewish, then you can believe in Jesus. And so any believer in Jesus has to keep the law. They have to observe the Sabbath. If they're a male, I'm sorry to say, you've got to get circumcised. Uh, you've got to keep kosher, no more ham sandwiches, no shrimp cocktail. You've got to, you've got to start keeping the law. Uh, that's what the, but then Paul comes along and says, whoa, no, in fact, the law's got nothing to do with it. 
And this leads to the personal implications. Paul realized that he himself had been called by God to take the message to the Gentiles. Paul called himself the apostle of the Gentiles. Paul knew that in the Jewish scriptures there are passages that talk about the Gentiles flocking to Jerusalem to accept the worship of the true God. Gentiles would come into the fold. There would be a light to the nations, a light to the Gentiles, who would enlighten the Gentiles about God's salvation. Paul came to think that he was the light to the Gentiles. Paul himself was the fulfillment of Scripture. Whoa. Uh, Paul did not think small. <laughs> Paul thought he himself was the one who had been predicted by the Hebrew prophets to bring the message of the God of Israel to the Gentiles who didn't have to become Jewish. They only had to believe in Christ. And so Paul began an apostolic mission. His mission field. Paul maintains that uh, the other apostles were to minister to Jews. They were to convert Jews. Peter, James, the other apostles, they go to Jews. Paul wants to go to the Gentiles. Well, who are the Gentiles? Uh, the Gentiles is everyone else in the Roman world. Uh, so uh, the Roman Empire is in dark here. You can see it's a rather large place going from uh, Britain and Spain all the way over to, uh, to over here at the, uh, the, this end of the Fertile Crescent. Uh, to Mesopotamia, uh, Europe, Southern Europe, and around the Mediterranean. Paul uh, understood his missionary field to be from just north of Palestine all the way over to Illyricum. He established churches in uh, Syria, possibly Syria, Cilicia, up here in Asia Minor. This is Galatia through here, along the west coast of Asia Minor, in Macedonia and Achaia, which is Greece, in Macedonia today. Uh, he wanted to go to Rome. Uh, he writes his letter to the Romans saying he wants to go to Rome because he wants to use Rome as his base of operation to go all the way to the west, as far west as he could go, Spain. And so he's, he's going uh, one place to another in order to make converts among the Gentiles. How did he do it? This is an interesting question. Suppose you are a Christian missionary in the year 50, and you want to go start a church in some place you've never been to before. And so say you're going to go to Ephesus, and you're going to start a church there, and you don't know anybody in Ephesus. How do you do it? I mean, do you just like show up in town and set up your soapbox and in public and start preaching and hoping people will pay attention to you? Uh, well, there's no evidence that that's probably what happened. Uh, what, what a lot of people have thought is that what Paul did is he'd go to a city and he'd go to the synagogue. He's Jewish, he goes to the synagogue, other Jews there, and they've got a lot in common, they're all Jews, and then he starts telling them that actually, you know, the Messiah has come. And he starts telling them about the Messiah. And that he converts some people. And then he starts talking to their friends, who are their Gentile friends and their neighbors. And, he starts, and so he spreads from the synagogue out. That is entirely possible. That is exactly what happens in the book of Acts. That's how he does it in the book of Acts. So that makes sense. The problem is when you read Paul's letters, Paul talks to his congregations that he's writing his letters to and indicates that they are former pagans. There's nothing to suggest that these people are former Jews. It looks like he's converting pagans. Well, is he doing it through the synagogue or not? Well, I don't know. But uh, Paul himself actually gives a different way of proceeding. He talks about a different way of proceeding. This was recognized about 20, 25 years ago by, by specialists in the New Testament who came to realize that some of the passages in Paul indicate that he converted people by preaching on the job. So, Paul says in 1 Thessalonians, he reminds the Thessalonians, his first letter, he reminds the Thessalonians that when he was with them, he was working day and night while preaching the gospel to them. It used to be thought that that meant he was preaching day and night, but that's not what he said. 
he was actually working, and he says he was working day and night so as not to be a burden to any of you preaching the gospel. So he's actually working a job. Now, in the book of Acts, we're told that Paul was a leather worker. Uh, usually it's translated that he was a tent maker, made tents. Well, it might have been tents. Tents were made out of animal skins. Well, a lot of things were made out of animal skins. So uh, Paul may have just started a you know, Christian leather goods shop in a town. Uh, he goes in and he starts. And if he, if he was working with leather as his occupation, it's a portable uh, occupation. He could just take his knives and his awls and his other tools with him as he went from one place to another. And he'd go into a town and he'd set up a small business. There'd be other leather workers in town. He'd, they, they're always located in the same region. All the trades are located in the same part of town. He goes into town, starts up the leather goods shop, maybe rents out an apartment above to live in, which is a common arrangement. And he works the whole time, day and night. People come into the shop. And he starts talking to them. And he uh, you know, is, is a lot more uh, loose about, uh, about this kind of thing back then. They sit in, they have conversations, they have long conversations. Paul talks to them. And after a while, he starts telling them about Jesus and how Jesus is the Son of God, the Savior of the world, sent from the true God. And Paul talks to them, and at first they think he's a little bit crazy, but they think, well, it's kind of interesting. They come back, and, and eventually, say, you know, three or four months later, he actually converts somebody. And he converts, say he converts a man, and the man has a wife. The man makes sure his wife believes too, and his children. And then they start talking to the next door neighbor who comes to talk to Paul. And, they talk, and it goes on like that. And so, you know, after eight or nine months, he's got, he's got a small community of people who are Christians. And then once he's got that small community, they're meeting every week, and they're talking to their neighbors and friends and things, and they're starting to spread a little bit. And then Paul goes to the next city and does it again. He's planting churches probably by working on the job. What is he telling these people? He's telling them, first of all, that they worship gods that are powerless and worthless and of no use to them. What Paul says in 1 Thessalonians is that he convinced his listeners to turn to God from dead idols, to worship the living and true God, and to await His Son from heaven, Jesus Christ, who saves us from the wrath of God that is coming. He teaches them that their gods have no power, but His God does have power. Jesus is His Son, and if you believe in Him, you'll be saved when the end comes. That's why he's teaching people. It doesn't seem like that would convert anybody, but he doesn't have to convert a lot of people. He just needs to get a start. He needs to convince one person, and then he can convince another person, and the church starts to grow. How did he persuade anybody? It is interesting that what Paul says is that he convinced them by doing miracles. Really? Yep, that's what he says. Three times in his letters. The Holy Spirit worked through him doing miracles. We don't know what he means. He doesn't tell us what he means. Presumably, his readers know exactly what he's talking about because they were the ones there. It might be that what he's calling a miracle, we might think isn't such a miracle. Like, you know, he actually converted Fred over here. You know, who would have thought he would convert? You know, maybe, boy, that's a miracle. You know, so uh, he's doing something. I don't know. Or, he's, or maybe he's healing people. So I don't know what he's doing. But uh, he says is because of his miracles. Uh, and the thing is, he was preaching a miracle. He's preaching that Jesus was raised from the dead. That's an amazing miracle. And he could preach that one with conviction because he could say with conviction that he saw Jesus alive three years after he died. He saw him. He could say it with conviction, and over time, it, it convinced people, and people then started to convert. What was Paul's abiding influence? Well, his influence on, uh, on the history of Christianity is immense. I mean, 13 of the 27 books in the New Testament are written by him, Another book, Book of Acts, is written about him. So more than half of the books of the New Testament are pretty directly related to Paul. But I would argue that his most important uh, influence on the history of Christianity had to do with his realization that a person could be a follower of Jesus without being Jewish. This transformed what Christianity was. 
Jesus himself was completely Jewish. Nothing non-Jewish about him. He was completely Jewish. He was circumcised. He followed Jewish customs. He kept the Jewish law. He became a Jewish teacher. He got Jewish followers. He taught them the Jewish law. He, he was thoroughly Jewish. His followers after his death were Jewish, and they thought that anybody who's going to be a follower of Jesus has to be Jewish. He's a Jewish teacher. You're going to follow a Jewish teacher, you've got to be Jewish. Um, Paul came along and said, no, what matters is that Jesus' death and resurrection brings salvation. Now, with that, the other people would have agreed. Yes, that's what brings salvation. But what Paul said is the conclusion, therefore, is that the law doesn't matter. Gentiles must not convert to be Jews because if they do, they're saying that, they, that the law is what brings them into a right relationship with God, but it's not the law. It's only the death and resurrection of Jesus. And so this is a religion for Gentiles, not only Jews. If that had not happened, Christianity would have remained a sect within Judaism. And it would have had the historical significance of the Sadducees. Now, many of us know something about the Sadducees, but it's not like they're affecting our lives. Uh, Christianity would have been like that. That's why I think Paul is Christianity's most significant convert, because he transformed the religion into a worldwide religion, and it became very quickly a religion of Gentiles as it continued to be down through the centuries. Thank you very much. I will uh, take questions for, uh, I've got about 13 minutes in the back, yes. Regarding Paul's vision uh, of Christ, is there any evidence from which we can determine or which implies that he actually saw Jesus while he was alive? Good question. He's asking uh, about his vision of Christ. Is there any evidence that he actually saw Jesus while he was alive? And the answer is absolutely no. Uh, he, Paul apparently did not see Jesus when he was alive, which then naturally leads to the question, how did he know it was Jesus that he saw? <laughs> I think he wore a name tag. <laughs> Hi, I'm Jesus. Uh, no, I, I don't know. I mean, it's like you get this in the Bible, right? When Jesus in, is, Jesus in the Gospels uh, goes up on the Mount of Transfiguration and he takes his three disciples with him, Peter, James, and John, and he's up there, and then, Mo, then Moses and Elijah appear speaking to Jesus. Well, how do they know it's Moses and Elijah, right? It's just like, you just kind of know these things apparently. I, I don't know, I haven't had one of those. So, uh, yes, for sure. So couldn't one make the point that part of the reason Christianity spread was it was a lot easier, particularly then, to be a Christian. The only thing you have to believe in Jesus, you don't have to follow all these complex uh -huh. laws about diet and yeah, yeah. daily. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so wouldn't Christianity have an easier time spreading than Judaism? Uh, because, you, I mean, the main thing, of course, is circumcision. I mean, if you're, you know, I mean, it's not, not a very effective evangelistic tool to say you got. <laughs> yeah, so, uh, right. So, uh, yeah, probably. What I'm going to be arguing is that Judaism actually wasn't very missionary anyway. Like, they weren't really out trying to convert people. They just wanted to be left alone to worship their God. And so, but I would say that that's right, that if, if they had remained a sect within Judaism, they would have had a very hard time converting Gentiles. Yes. Yes, in the back here. Then I'll, I'll get to the back. Yes. You, yes. You. Uh, can you explain again, I've never heard that before, the Jewish belief about death and resurrection not being the belief of Christ. Right. Yeah, yeah. Um, so uh, Jewish apocalyptic thought is known to us by a number of texts from, uh, from the ancient world. The, the first, um, so, it's, okay, so I'm going to, it's kind of complicated, but the, the last book of the Hebrew Bible to be written was probably the book of Daniel. It doesn't seem that way because it's kind of in the middle someplace, but it probably was Daniel written in the second century BCE. And it's the first text in the Hebrew Bible that talks about an individual resurrection of dead people at the end of time. Daniel chapters 12, verses 1 through 3, that, that there's going to be a resurrection of dead people. After Daniel was written, uh, there are other Jewish texts that talk about this, and they, um, they understand resurrection as a kind of theodicy. So a theodicy, theodicy, as you know, is a, is a way to explain how there can be such suffering in the world if there's a God who's in charge of it. Theodicy literally means the righteousness of God. I mean, how can God be righteous given everything that's happening here and he's supposed to be in control? 
what these, what these Jewish apocalyptists have said is that God is in control ultimately, but he's letting things run their course now. But at the end of the age, he's going to intervene and he's going to resolve all of the evil that's happening. But it's not just going to be for people who happen to be alive at the time. There'll be a future resurrection of the dead. And so Daniel 12 and then other Jewish texts that are in the uh, Jewish apocryphal texts uh, that didn't get into the Bible uh, maintain this. And so this was a widespread view. Is the view, for example, of the people who produced the Dead Sea Scrolls? Um, is the view of, uh, the, uh, of the Pharisees? It was one thing that separated the Pharisees and the Sadducees. The Pharisees believed in the future resurrection of the dead, and, and so forth and so on. So this, this, Paul himself says that he was a Pharisee before he became a, a follower of Jesus, and so he, he just had this, this view of resurrection. Does that answer your question? Um, yeah, and then what happened? Is there a hell? I've never heard of Jesus. Uh, no, there's no hell yet. The, idea, the original idea for the resurrection appears to be that... Um, People are brought back, and there is a judgment. But the people, uh, people are, uh, who are not righteous, are zapped, on, are zapped and destroyed, and the others are given eternal life. And eventually, there's a development of the idea of a hell. Yeah, uh, up in the balcony. Yes. If if the Jewish idea of resurrection included the fact that bad people would be punished uh, and good people would be rewarded, yeah. Then how did Paul make the conclusion that Jesus, the first person that he believed was resurrected, was necessarily the first of the good people, as opposed to somebody who in fact was the first of the bad people, given the fact that, that Jesus had suffered uh, a cursed bill? Yeah, 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 good question. Did you all hear that? No. Okay. Uh, right. Uh, so... Uh, the basic question is, uh, if Paul thought that at the end there's a resurrection and uh, good will be rewarded, bad will be punished, why does he think that Jesus is one of the good? Why not think that he's raised and he's one of the bad? Uh, because after all, I mean, he did you know, get publicly humiliated and tortured to death. And so uh, the answer to that is similar to what I was saying before. When, when Jews at this period thought about a future resurrection, they appear to thought that when, when, there's a re when people are brought back into the body, the wicked are going to be destroyed at that moment. Um, and so, uh, and the, the, uh, the righteous will be rewarded, uh, and Jesus wasn't destroyed for Paul. For Paul, he, uh, you know, he'd been raised three years earlier, and Paul appears to have thought that Jesus had come to him from a heavenly existence. Um, in, in the ancient world, uh, there are a number of stories about people who are taken up to heaven after their death in the ancient world. You get this in Jewish sources, but you also get it in Greek sources and in Roman sources of somebody who's taken up into heaven. And when somebody's taken up into heaven after their death, they're made into a divine being. This, they're divinized. They're made a divine because they're living with the gods or with God. And so they're made a divine being. And so Paul thought that when Jesus was raised from the dead, he was actually taken up to live with God. And so he was a holy divine being. Uh, and so he wasn't seen as somebody who was wicked and destroyed. Other questions? Yes, in the back. What role do you think the, um, the Roman tyranny played in the uh, work of Christianity? The Roman tyranny over... Uh, With regards to the apocalyptic visions and yeah. the end of the world. Yeah, so what, what role did Roman tyranny play? Um, Sorry, when you asked that question, I, I had a flashback to the life of Brian. Uh, remember that passage in that part of the life of Brian where they're saying, what have the Romans ever done for us? And they started listing all this stuff, you know, so it's like, <laughs> so for some people, the Roman tyranny wasn't much of a tyranny. It was a pretty, pretty good thing. I mean, you know, it's like we have, we have roads now and we have, you know, so, so um, but there were people... Um, Especially um, people, in, there were people in Palestine who did feel, in fact, that the Romans were, uh, were tyrants and that were making life miserable for us. And it's usually thought that this kind of apocalyptic thinking uh, is um, encouraged by those situations of oppression. Um, that people who are really suffering are the ones more likely to subscribe to this view. You know, it's only going to be a little while. We just need to hold fast for a little while, and God will soon intervene, and then we'll be rewarded. Oh, just hold on for a little while longer. And so there's probably something to that. So a lot of these apocalyptic texts that we have from Judaism uh, did probably originate in, uh, in ancient Judea or uh, an ancient area of ancient Israel. Um, 
the Phar if Paul is a Pharisee, he's picking it up from, from other Pharisees who also have this idea. So the, the, problem, with, the ro problem with the Roman tyranny in, the, in Israel was, I mean, mo most people, you know, nobody likes being a conquered people. So, I mean, with the Romans conquered, you, nobody likes that. But it was especially bad in Israel because, uh, well, we still have this today. I mean, there, there were people in Israel who thought, this is our land. This is, God gave us this land. And so it's not just that it's a political nightmare, it's also a religious nightmare, and so it exacerbates the problem. And that, is, uh, that probably contributes to this kind of apocalyptic fervor that we see at the time. Yeah. Yes? You mentioned earlier about the culture beginnings, as you called it, with only like 20 believers. What about the others that Jesus would have preached to? What about the other people that people, I talk about these 20 people, what about the others that pe Jesus preached to? Uh, what I'm talking about when I say about the 20, I'm talking about people who believed he got raised from the dead. Um, it's kind of interesting that in the New Testament, those, the disciples, for example, the, the 11 disciples, are not said to go to Galilee to, to hook up with all these people, these thousands of people who'd heard pre Jesus preach. Why is that? And uh, you know, so you wonder, well, that would seem kind of like a natural missionary field. But... The fact you've heard Jesus tell parables doesn't necessarily make you inclined to think he got raised from the dead, right? So if he has these, these you know, if he talks about sores who go out and sow seed, you know, or talked about a prodigal son or something, it's like there's, no, there's nothing there that necessarily makes you think, oh, he's likely a likely candidate to be raised from the dead. And so it appears that the Galilean mission didn't go very far, if there was one. Yeah, it's interesting. Yes? The idea of uh, Jesus dying for our sins, other people's sins. Yeah. Um, is this a new idea, or was this idea in other um, uh, sources before that? Yeah. So the idea of Jesus dying for sins, is this idea that, that you could have a sacrifice for the sins of others, is that a new thing, or was that around? And so the, I think the kind of closest analogy may be... Um, well, actually, I would say that, um, that this is a view that you get uh, th throughout a variety of religions at the time. You get, it, um, you get it in Judaism probably with the Jewish idea of the Day of Atonement. Uh, so in, uh, on one day of the year, uh, on Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, uh, the, um, the, pre the high priest would go into the Holy of Holies, which was the, the, the curtained off area within the temple, this cubicle room, that uh, had nothing in it, but God was thought to dwell there. And the, the Jewish high priest would go behind the curtain and would perform a sacrifice uh, for his own sins and then perform a sacrifice for the sins of the people. And that would be the atonement then for... And um, uh, so that would be kind of a Jewish way of doing it. And in, in, in Roman religions, there are often civic sacrifices where you know, the city would come together and they're... You know, you get your hundred, hundred people together, and uh, everybody's just watching while they sacrifice, you know, an animal, and then they, they all, they have a big party. They eat, the, they eat the meat, they cook the meat, they eat the meat. But the sacrifice is thought to make the god, uh, this particular god, satisfied with the community, and so you get, you get kind of comparable ideas, but especially that the Day of Atonement thing, I think, and so that's why the the Christian authors, like in the Gospels, they portray Jesus as an atonement for sins because they're they're linking it to the Jewish idea of the Day of Atonement. I think I have time for one more question. I need to stop. Yes. During this early period, Jesus's brother James was active in Jerusalem, and he seems to have considered himself a Jew who was carrying out Jesus's word. Are we going to be talking about? What was going on among Jews who were adhering to Jesus, even though their numbers were small? Um, yeah, so she's asking, I mean, you, in Jerusalem, you get uh, James, the brother of Jesus, appears to become the leader of the church. Probably the first leader is Peter, but then James kind of takes over. James becomes the big figure in Jerusalem. And she's asking, what about, you know, the... Uh, are we going to be talking about what happens with the Jewish, uh, Jewish Christianity as, as it's spreading? I'm not going to talk about that so very much because um, it was uh, by, the end, by, the end, by the time of Paul, the vast majority of people converting are Gentiles. The Jewish mission never really took off very much. 
There are pockets of Jewish Christians that go on for several centuries, actually, um, who continue to claim allegiance to James, but they're very much on the margins within Christianity. They're, they're tiny slices here and there. Uh, they never become a major force, and they never seem to have much impact really throughout, throughout the Roman world. So I won't be saying too much about them because I'm going to want to talk about kind of this big phenomenon of how you end up with 30 million people. Uh, almost all of them are, are Gentiles. I need to stop here. I think we've got a 15. Is that right? Do I marry? Is it time for me to stop? That's now, right? Back at 11. Great. Okay, thank you.